The following is a presentation of Seaside Community Baptist Church. Prophecy has tremendous implication. Prophecy pertains time, place, and a person. It extends through the whole dimension. The word of God that he speaks is established forever. When God says something, it is established. It goes forth and does its work, its work. The word will go and do its job. I'll give you one example in history. Sometimes we might limit, limit prophecy to the past or the future, but we don't see the implications in the present. Has God said something or done something in the past that has implications today? There's one date I want you, want you to look at. It's called Tishbi Av, which means the ninth of Av according to the Hebrew calendar. The Jewish people have that calendar. It has civil calendar as well as religious calendar in the same cycles. So in that month, one of the month is called the month of Av. And the ninth of Av, something interesting has happened uh, for the Jewish people, God's people of the Old Testament, God's people of the future. God's, did, God's people of the present as well. God did something so wonderful or something so significant that this day has been etched in the memories of the Jewish people, the ninth of Av. It is known as the saddest day in the Jewish calendar. The saddest day in the Jewish calendar. We think about the Holocaust and all that has happened, and we think about all those tragedies, and we say, yeah, that's a day that they commemorate every year, but there is a day where every Jewish person fasts. They don't smile. They refrain from alcohol or drinks or anything. It's known as the saddest day, the ninth of Av. Why is it the saddest day? What has happened uh, throughout Jewish history on that particular date? So I'll take you through a little bit. And, and, and show you what has happened. When Moses and the Israelites came to the promised land, almost near the promised land, they didn't enter, Moses sends 12 spies into the land of Canaan. And out of these 12 spies, only two, Joshua and Caleb, come back with a positive report. But the rest of the 10 bring bad news because they see giants in the land. They see these Canaanites, they're huge and powerful, and they get scared. And these 10 people who bring bad report, they say, we can't enter the promised land. We cannot defeat them. They're too big. They're too huge. But only Joshua and Caleb speak positive and give good report. The rest bring this sad news, which causes the whole Israelite camp to panic, to cry in despair, because they will not be able to enter the promised land. They don't have the faith to do it. They came out of Egypt. They're in the borderline entering the promised land, but their faith is now dampened by this report that the ten guys bring. God judges the nation of Israel that day, and he says, because of your lack of faith in me and my abilities, that is God saying it, I could have taken you to the promised land. You could have defeated the enemy. Because you lack the faith, you will not enter the promised land until, until every one of that generation perishes. You know, the distance from Egypt to the land of Canaan, where the Israelites have to go, is actually takes only 27 days to travel. 27 days. How long did it take the Israelites to get to the promised land? 40 years. Men still don't ask for directions. No, that's not the problem there. Right? So they had a problem because they couldn't enter the promised land. Simple reason why, because they lacked the faith. And that happened on the ninth of Av, according to the Hebrew calendar. Moving on in this schedule, in 421 BC, the first temple, the temple that Solomon built, was destroyed by King Nebuchadnezzar on Tishbi Av, the exact same day. During the time, 100,000 Jewish people were killed. The remaining were taken into exile, into Babylon and Persia. 70 AD, the destruction of the second temple by Titus Vespasian happened on the same day. Same day, 
9th of Av, where uh, 2.5 million Jews uh, died as a result of war, famine, and disease. uh, 1 million Jews have been exiled to various parts of the Roman Empire. 100,000 Jews were sold as slaves to the Romans. They were killed in gladiatorial games and pagan celebrations. 70 AD, second temple destroyed, same day. And uh, 132 AD, there's a Bar Koba revolt that happened, the last big revolt of the Jewish people against the Roman Empire. The, and during that day, on that particular 9th of hour, 100,000 Jewish people were killed, the third major rebellion by the Jewish people ever. 133 AD, uh, Turnus Ruf, uh, Rufus plows the temple ground, the pl- place where uh, the temple once stood. It was completely proud, and he built a city called um, Ele- uh, uh, Elia Capitolonia, Capitolona. That's the city he built. He destroyed the entire city on the same day. In 1095, the first crusade of the Catholic Pope Urban III uh, was declared. And on the same day, ten, uh, in the same first month, 10,000 Jewish people were killed, and a lot of uh, Jewish people were obli- obliterated. In, uh, in France, in, in the surrounding areas. In 1290, the Jews were expelled from England. Massacres, confiscation of property, and books happened on 9th of Av, the same day. Moving on, 1492, Inquisition of Spain culminates with the expulsion of Jews from the Iberian Peninsula. Families were separated, many die by drowning, massive loss of property, same day, 9th of Av. Okay, 1914, Britain and Russia declare a war over Germany. The First World War is declared on Tishbi Av, the 9th of Av, during which uh, it was an unresolved war, so they had to have the Second World War, and 75% of all the Jewish people were involved in wars, and they were killed in a massive numbers, and you know the rest of the history where there are 400 massacres that happened big time in Hungary, Ukraine, Poland, and Russia. In 1942, the deportation of the Jewish people happened on 9th of Av uh, uh, Av from Warsaw and Treblinka concentration camps. That's when it actually began, the deportation of the Jewish people. 1994, the deadly bombings of the Jewish community center in Buenos Aires and Argentina where 86 people were killed and more than 300 others were injured. 9th of Av. You see how prophecy or the declaration of God transcends time? You see how God declares something and is established forever? That is the power of God's word. That's the day the Jewish people uh, use and call this the day of mourning. You can search any history. They list out all these details, what happened in the exact same day. And last year I was looking at the calendar and and it falls in the month of, between the month of July and August. I was looking what's going to happen on 9th of Av. So I was looking into the timetable. So watch out. We don't really know how time and history repeats itself, but God has his plan. And when he establishes something, it keeps on going until God says, you're forgiven. It's a marvelous way that the word of God is established. So don't look to prophecy as something of the past or something of the future. It transcends time. It's applicable even today. When God says something, he will do it. That's our mighty God. He does what he says, and he means what he says as well. Amen? Amen. So during one such incident, in the, on the 9th of Av, 421 BC, when Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came and attacked Jerusalem, he destroyed the city, just destroyed the temple, and he took all these uh, young uh, wise men back to Babylon so that they can serve him uh, in his kingdom. Many people were killed. One of them that was led astray was a young man named Daniel. Daniel, you see a book in the Bible in the Old Testament, one of the beloved prophets of God. God, through a series of visions and prophetic visions and uh, uh, dreams, he instructed him to write down certain details about the end time events. A series of prophecies were given to Daniel. And the past prophecies, several of Daniel's prophecies were fulfilled with 100% accuracy. Many of the skeptics, when they read Daniel, which came before uh, any incident happened in the past regarding Alexander and his division of his kingdom into four parts. All of those things Daniel prophesied. And many skeptics say Daniel wrote that after the events have happened. That's how many details Daniel wrote with that much accuracy. Daniel's prophecy is right on. So this young man separated by God uh, was led astray to this foreign land. 
And these people were led into captivity into the land of Babylon for 70 years. And here is Daniel, and one day he's growing old, and uh, one day while he was reading the book of Jeremiah, he comes across a particular scripture as to when this captivity in Babylon is going to end. And this is what Daniel read in the Bible. He says, the, this whole country will become desolate and wasteland. These nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. But when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation and the land of Babylon, uh, Babylonians for their guilt, declares the Lord, and I will make it desolate forever. So what happened here is when Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar came to Babylon, or came to Jerusalem, destroyed the city, took the Jewish people uh, captive into this exile, uh, into this land called Babylon, nobody knew how long they would be held as captives in this foreign land. But as one day as Daniel was reading these scriptures, he came across this prophecy from Jeremiah that this captivity in Babylon is only going to last for 70 years. So that's when he got excited. And what Daniel does, the next thing is he begins to pray. He saw that his servitude or the slavery in the foreign land is going to end soon. It's almost over. So what does he do? He begins to pray and intercede for his people. The strange thing is, if God already promised that He's going to redeem His people from this exile, take them to the promised land in 70 years' time, and the time is coming to an end, why pray? If God is going to do what He declared anyway, why pray? That's something you thought about? Why do we? Why do we have to pray for the second coming of Jesus Christ? Do we have to? What does the Lord's Prayer teach us? A Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Are we praying for His coming? We are. Just because we know what times are ahead, what uh, God is going to do, doesn't negate the fact that we get comfortable with that news. God expects us to take responsibility to intercede for our nation, to intercede for the situations that are going on globally. It is our responsibility. Daniel poured out his heart in supplication and interceding for his people to forgive their sins. He was repenting himself. It was a 21-day prayer that was interrupted by an angel. I don't mind being interrupted by an angel when I'm praying, do you? Okay, it's okay. It's good news. So here is Gabriel. He says Gabriel was there, and Gabriel says, Daniel, you are the most beloved. God has highly favored you, Daniel, and he gives him some good news. What is the good news? It is called the prophecy of these end times. He gives a prophecy known as the 70-week prophecy. And this prophecy, Daniel chapter 9, is one of the most critical chapters we need to understand if you want to know what's going to happen in the future. And this prophecy consists of three elements. Number one, the coming of Jesus Christ and his rejection as the Messiah. This prophecy contained how Jesus Christ will come in the future, Daniel's future, 500 years from the day he started, uh, uh, the day he was in Babylon, how he's going to come and how there will be a destruction of the city of Jerusalem, not the one that happened during his lifetime, one in the future, and also the future times of the Antichrist and tribulation. So we covered the first half of the prophecy last week, 70 weeks part A. This is what it said. 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city, Daniel. This is what the angel is saying. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision of prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. The angel was telling Daniel, something spectacular is going to happen in the days ahead. And he gives a 70-week timetable. We'll understand what weeks are in a little bit. And he says, there'll be end to transgression, end of sins. There's reconciliation for iniquity. He gives six things in a list that is going to happen in the future. It's all, it's, it's all going to be fulfilled. It sums up the mission of what Jesus Christ came to do on this earth. And then the angel gives the breakdown of the 70 weeks. He breaks it down into 69 weeks, which are further broken down into 7 and 62 weeks. 7 plus 62 makes... Let's not... Let's... <laughs> okay, 7 plus 62. 69 weeks and the remaining one week, okay? That's a complete schedule, the breakdown. And here is a breakdown for Daniel that, uh, that's recorded in the Scriptures. Daniel chapter 9, 
verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and, uh, re and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troubled times. And then it continues to say, and after the 62 weeks, the Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Before we proceed further, I last time covered what this word weeks is all about. What is this word week? See, if you look at the Israelites' history, 70 weeks, 70 times 7, that's 490 days. Nothing spectacular happened in 490 day period for the Israelites. So what is this week? The Hebrew people have a way of counting uh, the years in terms of this, uh, by using this word called sabu, which means a week. Seventy times a week is seven, seven years. That's what it means. Just like the Greeks brought the word decade. When we say, uh, how long ago did you come to Canada? It's a dec decade plus three years. If I say decade plus three years, you understand decade means ten. For the Jewish people, it, the calendar goes in the periods of seven years. You with me so far? So the 70 times 7 is 490 years. That's the timetable that God gives Daniel. In 490 year period, God is going to do something spectacular. This is the fulcrum of the whole understanding the whole prophecy. You with me? Look at it for a little bit just to get that. 490 years, okay? You good? Etched in your memory? Okay, now we can move on. Okay, so now it, it's broken down into 62 and 7 weeks plus the one extra week. The total makes it 70. So last time we covered about the details and the specificity of the prophecy. When God says something, He doesn't just beat around the bush. He's very accurate in the details. Last time we saw that. And we saw Mr. Robert Anderson, Sir Robert Anderson, did some tremendous calculations about the coming prince. So he calculated, according to the prophecy, from the going forth of the commandment by Artaxerxes Longimanus in March 14, 445 BC, he calculated the 62 plus 7, that's 69 years, and it fell on 3280, March uh, 3280, April 6th. That's when the Messiah will be cut off. In the Old Testament, the word cut off means death. So Messiah, or the Christ Jesus who's coming, should die on March, uh, on April 6, 3280, but he didn't. According to his calculations, it ended up four days short of his execution. And last week we saw why it was four days short, because Jesus is the Lamb of God. A lamb is taken to the temple Four days before the actual execution. Jesus Christ entered the temple four days before his actual crucifixion. Where he's inspected, the lamb is inspected for blemishes. The Christ was inspected for false. The false teachers were trying to accuse him, find false in him, but they couldn't. And Pilate declares at the end, I find no fault in him. So Jesus Christ entered on April 6, 32 AD, just four days short, but fulfills the prophecy where Messiah is cut off as soon as the lamb was presented to the temple, to the priest. And then, this is where, we, this is all that we covered. If you want to see the details, it's there in last week's sermon. And then, this verse 26 talks about a little bit of interval. And then, this verse 27. So, this is how the bigger picture looks. 25, 26, 27. If you can get this, you'll have the complete history of what's going to happen in the future. So we saw the 69 weeks, 7 plus 62, Christ was crucified. And after that, there is something that needs to happen that begins the interval. And this is what the Bible says. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end of it shall be flood. Uh, till the end of the war, desolations are determined. The people of the prince, they're talking about the final Roman Empire, or 78 is a reflection of the same thing. The people of the prince, they shall destroy the city of Jerusalem and its sanctuary. There's something that needs to happen after the Messiah is cut off. This is the next incident. In order to understand this, Jesus Christ elaborates this a little further, and we'll try to understand what he said. 
What does this mean? The, pre, uh, the people of the prince coming and cutting off and destroying the city of Jerusalem and the sanctuary. Jesus Christ, after he comes down, riding on the donkey and entering Jerusalem, that's the first stage. Strangely enough, it parallels Daniel 9. The next thing he does is he weeps over the city of Jerusalem. He weeps over the city because he declares its future and it says this. The Bible says, and as he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it. Jesus Christ wept over the city saying, if you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. The king is Jesus Christ. He came as a humble servant riding on a donkey entering the city. The Jewish people could not identify their Messiah when he came for the first time. They made a mistake, and they didn't recognize. As a result of that, God pronounces judgment. Christ pronounces judgment and says, but now it will be hidden from your eyes. Why is the Messiah hidden from the Jewish, people eyes? Jewish people's eyes? Very simple. Luke 19, 44 says this, continues in that same chapter. He says, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Isn't it strange that Christ held the people accountable for not knowing the time of his visitation? Isn't that interesting that God declared and, uh, and he, the pro, through the prophecy that he's going to come and people need to anticipate his coming? And if you're not anticipating his coming, you're responsible? You're responsible for knowing about the end times, my friends. You're responsible for knowing what God is about to do. You do not want to miss the time of his coming, of his return. It's a responsibility for us. It's very important. Otherwise, see, the judgment is chilling because it says you did not recognize the time of his coming. Then Jesus Christ continues to declare this, and he says this. For the days will come upon you. This is around 32 AD. Remember, Jesus Christ just entered the city of Jerusalem. He's outside the city. He's weeping for the city. And he says this. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you and surround you and close you on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. They will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Jesus Christ declares... The enemy shall come in the near future. He's going to level your place, including your children, everybody. He'll not leave one stone upon the other because they did not know the time of the visitation. It's a very serious judgment. No wonder Christ was weeping. Believe it or not, just 38 years after Christ made that declaration, 38 years after Christ made that declaration, the Roman legions uh, led by Titus Vespasian, laid siege to Jerusalem for nine months. They slaughtered over a million men, women, and children. Another half a million died of famine and disease. The fall of Jerusalem occurred in 70 AD. It's a major milestone in Jewish history. That's the beginning of where the end of the nation of Israel started, where they all scattered away. They were taken and they, were, they ran into exile to all parts of the Roman Empire. The city was utterly destroyed and Christ said something very strange. He said, not one stone will remain upon the other. When Herod the Great built the temple, it was a great and grand structure covered in gold, a magnificent building, and people never expected that temple to be destroyed. People never expected, people boasted about that temple. The disciples were boasting about the greatness of this temple in Jerusalem. And Christ said, not one stone will remain upon the other. You want to know how, how truly, how uh, literally this prophecy came true? You know, when the Romans attacked the city, they burned the temple. But this temple was overlaid. The inner sanctuary was overlaid with gold. And when the, because of the heat from the fire, the gold melted in between the rocks. So for the soldiers, in order to get to the gold, they had to remove stone upon stone until none of the stones remained. This is the picture of the stones that are, have fallen from that temple. You can still see in the streets of Jerusalem, the streets have been dented because of the rocks falling from the temple, because the soldiers were 
taking one stone at a time do not reach that gold that fell through the cracks when it melted, and you can still see burnt marks upon those stones. It happened in history, 70 AD. How accurate is this prophecy? Then he said, Christ said, they will not leave in you one stone upon the other because you did not know the time of your visitation. So after the destruction of Jerusalem, the interval began. There's a space in between the 69th, 69 weeks and the 70th week, and that's the time of the interval. The clock for Israel stopped. This time here, the 69 weeks is completely and utterly for Israel, and the 70th week is also for Israel. But in between, we are in the period called in-between period. It's a time of the Gentiles. So that space is there in that scripture, which we, we can't see it. So Israel's clock stopped. The churches, the Gentiles' clock started. And once the church or the Gentile church is complete, that's us, God will start his clock again with Israel and fulfill the 70th week. You with me so far? Okay. Praise the Lord. There is a distinction. Many people have trouble in understanding the timings. The only reason why a majority of the scholars, so-called scholars, have issues is because they don't understand the destiny of Israel. They don't understand the separation of the Gentile church. You have to separate both. Israel and church are two separate things. Both have different origins, different missions, and different destinies. And all these four are the verses that were given to Daniel are significant for the nation of Israel. We are in the period in between, and the prophecy is coming together. So once the destruction of the temple happens, then uh, the prophecy continues, and that verse 27 records this, the 70th week. It says, And then he shall confirm a covenant with many for a week, but in the middle of the, uh, but in the, middle of the week... He shall bring an end to the sacrifice and offering on the wings of abominations, shall be the one who makes, who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the, is poured out on the desolate. We'll cover this uh, uh, probably in a couple of weeks' time. But I just want to dwell on this chart so that you can understand and comprehend the times that we are living in. Here is a simple equation. So the commandment from Artaxerxes to Christ's triumphal entry is 69 weeks. You got that? Two, uh, the seven plus 62 weeks. Seven, God broke it down into seven and 62 weeks. Very simple. The reason why is because the city of Jerusalem was rebuilt at the end of seven weeks. At the end of 50 years, after the commandment was given, the city of Jerusalem was rebuilt. And after that, from there, 60, another 62 weeks is 69 years. The Messiah came, Christ came, and he was, uh, he was having this triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And the 70th week, the passage that we just read, in the middle of it is the abomination of desolation. And we are in this interval right now. If you didn't get this, let's uh, break it down even further, okay? I have this plan, okay? <laughs> and it's not, you're all smart people. I just tried to break it down here, okay? From creation, Adam and Eve, flood, exodus, exile, exile of the Israelites into Babylon to the coming of Christ. So the nation of Israel first became a nation in the book of Exodus chapter 1. They were not a nation till then. The word nation was used then as slaves in Egypt. That's how they began. That nation of Israel, God was dealing with them until the execution of Christ, until the birth of the church. God still has his eye upon his people. Don't ever think that God left Israel. God still works with his people. But in order to understand the timeline, this is what it is. But from the time of exile, from the declaring of the commandment, I couldn't fit in this one chart. The chart would go from here to here. So that's why I had to crush everything here, okay? And the 69 weeks falls in that little profile there. And at the end of the crucifixion of Christ begins, Bible uses these words, the times of the Gentiles, or the fullness of the Gentiles, or the birth of a church. These are, we are the Gentile church. That's the period that we're living in. So when the temple was destroyed, the Jewish people were scattered all over the world, all over the world. And the word that's used to describe that is called diaspora, diaspora. And when is the fullness of the Gentiles happens? When is the church complete? In, not, I'm talking, I'm not talking about seaside, the church, the body of Christ. When the last soul is saved of this Gentile church, the, the clock for the church stops and God begins to work. 
continues to work with the nation of Israel. One of the indications that God gave for us as a church to recognize the last days is how the Jewish people will come back together after the scattering from all over the world. And it happened on May 14, 1948. That's a key indicator that we are not far from the return of Christ. I'll try to elaborate that one little circle there next week. The whole sermon is based on that circle, okay? So what's happening here? The Jewish people were scattered. They all come back together. And that's an indicator that the fullness of the church, of the Gentiles, the time is coming to an end for the Gentile church. And after this, uh, okay, this is one scripture that will help you understand how God is working. Romans eleven twenty five 25 says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced the hardening in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. It's very straightforward, isn't it? Every person that gets saved, the devil is terrified. You're getting that close to the full number of Gentiles. And then when the full number of, uh, is reached, that's when the ch- church, the bride of Christ, is taken out. And we'll be in the presence of God. The full number of Gentiles comes, and again, God begins work with the nation of Israel, according to this chart here. So that, when the church is taken up, it begins that one week, fulfills that one week, that week is the week of seven years. Remember, week is seven years, right? So that begins the week of the tribulation. And then comes the kingdom, the millennial uh, thousand-year reign. Do you see the sequence there? So this is the chart that we are living in. The critical thing to know is Israel has already become a nation in 1948. And on that very day that nation of Israel came into existence, approximately, some scholars say, 13 prophecies were fulfilled on that very day. No nation has, in history has been scattered for 2,000 years and come back, came back and became a nation. No nation ever in history. That's a clear indicator. Israel is God's timepiece. If you want to know that God exists, look at Israel. It's a miraculous event that has happened in history, which I'll elaborate next week and talk about Israel a little bit because that will strengthen our faith. But we need to know that we are that close to the return of the Lord. So we're coming to the critical fulcrum. How do you want to apply this sermon? Well, I'm going to show something very interesting. Seven times seven, 70 times seven, 490 years. The penalty was declared after, you know, after uh, uh, Israel's history. If it's broken down into 490-year segments, there's something wonderful that comes out. Clarence Larkin did some hard work in breaking the history of Israel into 490-year periods. This is what he came up with. I found this very fascinating. From the time of Abraham to Exodus, Abraham was the first Jew, right? He was called from the Gentile nation. He's the first Jew. From Abraham to Exodus, there were 490 years. This is how it's broken down. How we calculate it is very simple. The promise given to Abraham is in Genesis 12, verse 4. He was 75 years old. Until the number of years till Exodus that's coming out of Egypt, Galatians 3, 17, is, you add those two, it's 505 years. The time where Abraham was not under the covenant. When Ishmael was born, Ishmael was not the promised son, Isaac was, was 15 years. If you take out the 15 years from 505 years, it results in 490 years. So when you take the time of favor minus the time where the Israel, nation of Israel is not in favor, you get 490. With me? Time of favor time of blessings for the nation of Israel minus or take out the time of bondage or slavery, it is 490 years. Moving on. So Abraham to Exodus is 490 years. Exodus to the first temple, the temple that Solomon Solomon built was another 490 years. Let's break it down. Temple was uh, uh, Exodus begun according to 1 Kings chapter 6 and to chapter 8. 
594 years, minus when the temple was completed, it took another seven years. It's 601 years of, of the time period, okay? Minus, if you take out the years of slavery, Israelites were slavery every time they rebelled against God. God used the nation surrounding Israel to teach them a lesson. Just like any father who wants to discipline his children. You know, sometimes when your kids are going crazy, you don't just watch and say, I love them, I love them. There's discipline that God expects us to do. There's a discipline that the Father God, because He loves them, He doesn't leave them and abandon them. The chastisement from God is important in our life, my friends, because it produces the harvest of righteousness and peace. The Bible says, I think in Hebrews 6, when God disciplines us, doesn't mean it's wrong. So when Israelites were disobedient, God uses the surrounding nations, the Mesopotamians, the Moabites, the Canaanites, Midianites, Ammonites, Philistines, and the rest of the parasites. He just tortures them, right? And then they repent of their sins, and again they'll give their lives back to God. And that period of slavery was 111 years. So the total years of God's favor, again, 601 years minus 111 years is 490. Same. Okay, moving on. The temple to Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes is the guy who made the decree. Okay? We saw Abraham to Exodus, 490 Exodus to the first temple. These are the years of favor. Okay? First temple to Artaxerxes' decree is another 490 years. How does he break it down? It's so the first Kings uh, chapter 8, verse 1 to 66. It's like uh, 1005 BC to Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1, 445 BC. From the temple to Artisus, the decree was 560 years minus the captivity in the land of Babylon, which is 70 years, which gives you again 490 years. With me so far? Okay, we're moving on. One more. Say, from Artisus, Artisus, don't name your kids that. Artisus' decree to second coming. Another 490 years. How does, it, how does that breakdown happen? We saw this. This is the prophecy we are talking about. The 69 weeks is 483 years, but there's one more week. You know, this church interval, which we take it out because of the Gentile church, but we add the 70th week with 483. It's again 490 years. The equation is very simple. Abraham to Exodus 490, Exodus to the temple 490, temple to the edict of Artaxerxes 490, Artaxerxes to the second coming minus the church interval is another 490 years. So, this is the mathematical equation we need to remember. Period of grace minus the period of judgment has the equation 490 years. Okay? Period of grace minus period of judgment is equal to 490 years. Now, this is where we'll draw it all together. In Matthew chapter 18... Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Interesting. Have you ever thought why he said 70 times seven, not 80 times eight? Have you wondered why it's not 60 times six? Why 70 times 7? 70 times 7, 490 years. Is there something that God is trying to teach there? Israelites had favor with God for 490 years. It's a time and the period of grace. But when that grace has ended, the judgment has come. That's strange. So there's a period of time, 70 times 7. God's grace, my friends, is wonderful, it's powerful, it's transforming. But don't ever take for granted that God's grace is there forever and ever and ever and can do whatever I want. Because the Bible says, do not take His grace in vain. Because once the grace ends, the judgment comes. That's what has happened with the nation of Israel. That is why Christ said 70 times 7. The Bible clearly says, it's appointed for a man once to die, but after this is judgment. Some scholars say we are living in a period called grace period. 
I'd say right from the creation, it's all about grace. Even in the Old Testament, you see the grace of God. It's been grace all along. Sending His Son, it's grace. His Son dying on the cross, it's grace. But that grace is going to end soon. But this is the time for us to respond. Because once the grace ends, the judgment comes. The Bible says in Isaiah 49, 8, this is what the Lord says, In the time of my favor, I'll answer you. In the day of salvation, I will help you. I'll keep you and make you a covenant, a covenant for people. I'll restore the land to reassign its desolate inheritances. The question for us this morning is, have we taken the grace of God in vain? Have we taken the grace of God for granted? If that's the case, to this morning I want you to think about this. It's time to know that there is a judgment that comes next. Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, For thus we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things we have done while in the body, whether good or bad. The Bible even says, for every idle word we speak, we have to give an account before God. The grace of the Lord has been abused by Christians, including myself. The grace of the Lord has been taken in vain. But remember, if for all this one lesson that we can learn from Israel this morning in the 490, 70 times 7 cycle, the grace ends, judgment comes. So today is a day to repent of our ways where we take God for granted. We take our Christian walk for granted, our intimacy with God for granted. And if we are slacking off in some dimension, some way or the other, it's time to repent. It's time to turn our, uh, our ways back to God because God promises us during this time we are eligible to experience the restoration and grace of God. We're still in that period, my friends. We're still in that zone. Young people, if you are compromising with your lifestyle, it's time to turn back to God and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I've been slacking off. I call myself a Christian, but my words and my life doesn't match. Do you have that problem? I have that problem sometimes. Where my words and my actions, they don't match. Every day I pray, may my words and my actions be the same, O oh Lord. Don't take the grace of God in vain. If you're willing and if you're repentant in your heart, God is gracious enough to restore us. By some means, either through His chastisement or through His love, we can be restored. God restored the nation of Israel. He's not done with them yet. That's the love and the mercy of God that still abides. The same love abides in, on us, each individual sitting in this place. He still loves us. He wants you to reconcile with Him. He wants you to restore this intimacy with Him. Probably you're still sitting on the fence regarding God. You never made up your mind, Will I, do I want to serve Him or not? Choose this day whom you want to serve. Been sitting, thinking, okay, grace, grace, grace. In a moment, in a matter, in a moment, things can change. The Jewish people never expected their temple to be destroyed. When Christ was sitting with his disciples on Mount, Mount of Olives, they were pointing to the temple and saying, isn't that marvelous? Isn't that grand how great this temple is? And Christ disappoints them by saying, not one stone will remain on the other, it will be utterly destroyed. The whole world can fall apart in a moment. In a moment, things can change. Now is the time. This is the day of your salvation. Do not take His grace in vain. If you're becoming comfortable, if you're becoming callous and indifferent in your walk with the Lord, my friends, check your hearts before the rod of correction, the rod of rebuke from the Lord comes upon your life. It'll be painful, but God is all about restoration. He'll restore your life. Why do you want to go through the hardship? It's important to admit, repent, and reconcile with God if you have compromised in any capacity. I hope 
we understand what the mercy of God is. I hope we can understand what the love of God is. But I hope we can understand what the holiness of God also means. Holiness demands judgment because he's a God of justice. He cannot wink his eye like a grandpa sitting in the clouds in his white robes with the white hair, fluffy beard like Santa Claus and letting you go and do whatever you want. He cannot do that. His very nature is holy. His very nature demands judgment. So receive the grace of God today. Don't compromise anymore. Turn back from our wicked ways and we will see the favor of God. We will see the favor of God as we've seen in the history of Israel.